Um, this program is being recorded in part because two months ago we had some problems and some people didn't couldn't get entered and I, it was my fault because maybe the, the link was not accurate in that. So plus it's just nice to have a record of this. Plus there's, we have some important guests today. So, but before we do, um, let's just go around. I, uh, since we have uh, uh, this, this is not Zoom, this is Teams. I can't see your faces, but I can see the little circles with your uh, initials in, and, and when I hover, I can see who it is. So we'll just start. I'm going to go to the little first circle next to me. Link, you want to say who you are and who you're with? Link Cummings. I'm uh, chair of the Positive Aging, Inclusion, and Enrichment Committee, and uh, a committee uh, member of PIO to make sure we get the message out. Okay, thank you. Michelle? Good afternoon, everyone. Michelle Thomas, Program Coordinator of the Virginia Insurance Counseling and Assistance Program, also known as VICAP, where we provide Medicare counseling to Arlington County beneficiaries. I also serve as a staff liaison to the Public Information and Outreach Committee, and so pleased to be with you all here today. Yes, and thank you, Michelle, for being here. and helping us with this, this meeting. So, Carol Patch. Uh, hi, I'm Carol Patch. I'm a member of the uh, uh, commission. Okay, thank you. Thank you for being here, Carol. Uh, Jim Morris. I don't know if Jim, sometimes I know Jim can't, we can't hear his voice, but uh, Jim, you got your hand up. Oh, he's he's doing a volunteer uh, taxes. Ah, okay. I'm okay. looking at the chat. Ah, okay. Yes, Jim, and I could also say on Jim's behalf, Jim actually was uh, a guest on my pre-record Aging Matters show and talked about him being a volunteer tax aide. So. He's probably doing exactly what he was talking about today. So we'll hear more about that. So thank you, Jim. Wendy Zanker. Yeah, Wendy Zanker with Arlington Neighborhood Village. Okay. And Cindy Schneider. A newt here. Hi, I'm Cindy Schneider. I chair the um, housing committee of the Commission on Aging, and I'll be talking about what my committee has been up to. Yes, and thank you for being here. Glad that you're gonna join us and share information, so. Kate. Hello, everyone. Uh, Kate Chutwapi, uh, Manager of Senior Health for Virginia Hospital Center. I also serve on the commission and on a few of the committees. All right, thank you for being here, Kate. My pleasure. And Lori. Lori Young. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I'll start again. Uh, Lori Young, I'm on the Age Friendly Arlington Task Force and uh, have spent a number of years with the commission. Okay. And thank you for being here and welcome back from your lovely uh, vacation where it was much sunnier, although I guess it's better now, but. Well, but it was about 35 degrees warmer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thanks for being here, Laurie. And I know you're gonna give a presentation or at least some updates on, on the task force, <laughs> age friendly. Well, no, I didn't mean to shock you, I just. Uh, <laughs> But we're glad you're here to, to talk about that. So thank you. OK, well, without further ado, um, we are thrilled to have Martha Villanegro Santiago, who is a, an attorney as well as an aging advocate and consultant. And she is going to talk with us about living with dementia during the pandemic. And if you haven't looked in your email uh, box or your inbox, 
last night is when I sent it. She sent some really helpful information for folks to take a look at um, about this topic. But um, Martha, take it away and talk about this very timely topic. Yes, thank you, Cheryl. And, and above all, thank you for pronouncing my name so beautifully, <laughs> which is not an easy task. But anyway, but really, thank you for, for bringing the topic because, and I heard the radio programs, and actually I know um, Karen, and she really introduced me to another side of, of this changing um, world of living with Alzheimer's and dementia. But I find it, I since February of last year, like all of us, um, learning how to live with COVID. And I had the additional um, job of living with my mother with Alzheimer's and COVID. And that is a mouthful, much like my name. And it's a um, quite a quite a load, as all of you who know me uh, have heard me talk about or get very quiet about. But anyway, um, what I want to explain to you uh, is how difficult it's been, um, how how more stressful it is for both her and for myself and and the rest of us. But I think it is really helpful to begin by making the clarification of what dementia is and what Alzheimer's is. When you start talking about it, people, and I did the same thing. I worked with someone who always told me about her mother with Alzheimer's who's in the past. And we get the two terms confused. Dementia is a group of symptoms that everybody associates, unfortunately, with getting older. And so it's memory loss, but other things, other com communication difficulty. And Alzheimer's is a most common cause of dementia. And there are several other causes of dementia. And my mother, unfortunately, uh, got. And so she's been living with Alzheimer's now for almost eight years. And so with this pandemic, it just gave it a different twist and the unfortunate part is because, and this adds to it, one, because it's the most common uh, form of dementia, and also because we are in this other select group of Latinos with Alzheimer's. And add to that the pandemic. And so here we are with the pandemic, and the impact on her has been worse than just the Alzheimer's alone. So the stress she had before, the anxiety, and the general health decline uh, over the years, and as I said, it's been eight years, has been doubled, believe it or not, uh, because of this pandemic. And so it comes down to two things. Because of this lack of social direct connection. And what to understand, we need to understand is that the direct connection and what it offers to a person living with Alzheimer's, okay, it keeps them alert, it keeps them sharp, uh, happy just in daily life because the behaviors are such a moving target every day. And so with this and now these social distancing restrictions, there's nothing, you know, uh, there's absolutely nothing. And so when she got word, or I should say when I got word, that we didn't have any more social connection, uh, then it became more difficult. And people say, well, what about technology? Like we've all, all of us here, we're a little bit, you know, struggling with uh, getting on Teams or comparing it to Zoom and all this. And so the technology isn't the cure all. And I've said this to many people in, in many times that technology, if you're not tech savvy, uh, is already a difficult situation. And but her, uh, she believes that, just to give you an example, that me calling her on FaceTime is. We're, so she's putting the phone like this, or she's putting it like this. And so we really can't communicate. And add to that, that she is her hard of hearing. So, you know, I can talk to her and it's not, it's not really coming through. 
So it adds to this that I can't be with her. Uh, she doesn't have people coming in. And so we have that double stress of me not knowing how she's doing and she can't hear me uh, if I'm asking her how she is. And what she does most of the day is sitting in front of the TV. Okay. And so then we have the lack of understanding of what is the pandemic. So she may tell me that she understands. Okay. Mom, you understand why I can't come see you or you understand why uh, no one is coming in and why we're wearing masks. Uh, she may say one day she understands. And last week we had our very first visit, very first visit after a year. And the most that I can do is see her in the lobby of Cherrydale only because the weather was cold. And they decided that luckily, uh, because all of you know that I'm quite the extrovert. So as soon as they released the restrictions, she said, oh, no, you were the first one I called because I know you're here all the time. Um, so instead of sitting outside the window, uh, I sat on the other side of uh, usually I was sitting outside the window. But because it was inclement weather, it was very cold last week, as you may remember, as opposed to today. And so she said, listen, I'll decide. When it's when it's fine. So I went in, but immediately uh, we walked into the lobby, but I had to keep a distance. And so, again, my mother is hard of hearing. So right away, she was like, you have to stand over there and she's going to be over here. And we're wearing masks. So one, I'm yelling at her. And so I told the lady who happens to speak Spanish and I said, she won't hear me. So I'm in the lobby of Cherrydale screaming at my mother now. You may know that Hispanics usually yell. We love each other. It's just that this is the way we speak. Um, so I'm yelling at the top of my lungs in the lobby. And we're getting by, you know. But this is the this is the visit. And so to highlight how she really doesn't understand, she said to me, so she just gave me this thing. So how long do we have to keep wearing this thing? I said, Mom, is, if you want to see me so I can see you, we have to keep wearing this thing. You know, um, and so the impact clearly has been really difficult, really difficult. And so you think about, in addition to that, her hearing, the distance, the lack of, of contact. But you add to that, and that's why I mentioned about the fact that we are Latino, is that most of the news, and she may be looking at this stupid box and by the way, I learned most of my English watching English television. But anyway, so she will look at TV all day. But her attention span, as you may know, with Alzheimer's is like this. So, of course, I was in the lobby and she was looking at everybody that was passing. But in her room, um, she understands some English. I mean, Jesus Christ, she's been in the country for 60 years. And so um, she understands bits and pieces. But... What is she getting of pandemic news? Okay. It's in English. It's in English. And then her comprehension of what they're talking about, the efficacy that it took forever for people to understand to say, um, she has no idea what was. So her lack of understanding is up here. You know, so what does she really understand of the pandemic? And so I may repeat it to her. And, and as she does me repeat, so how are you today? Uh, I will tell her and tell her. But what does she really understand? Uh, I don't know. And in terms of the pandemic impact on the family, on myself, uh, everything is doubled. The anxiety, the stress, the general health. I have never been in more visits to specialists in the last year than ever before. Uh, and I don't know what her condition is going to be on a daily basis. And now it's worse because I don't have the social contact. You know, I don't see how really she's doing, you know, and I may call and call, but because she's not hearing the phone, I really don't know. Is she okay? Uh, she had COVID last year. But thank God she had, I guess, a very mild or maybe even the symptomatic 
version of it, or as her favorite nurse said to me, listen, as long as your mother stays in the room with her roommate, they will be fine. And so it was. So she was fine. But as she reminds me a thousand times, but you know, honey, it's going to impact me even more because, because I have asthma. Now, mind you, in my lifetime, she only had one attack of asthma. One. That she was hospitalized. And, but that much she's grasped from the news. So in terms of knowing how she's doing on a daily basis, how her mind is, you know, I don't know. But then does she test positive again for COVID? Uh, does it come worse than it came last year? Yes, thankfully she got her, her vaccines. And she was quite, you know, good about it. As I said to Carlos, and I, and I did a spot for him uh, so that Latinos would not be afraid of getting the vaccine uh, because she's always been one to say, give me a shot. I'd rather they give me a shot than to take a pill. I'm not afraid. So I had her take a picture or I took a picture of her on the other side of the, of the, of the glass a few weeks ago. And I said, Mom, show me where did you get? Because, of course, I signed the consent and lawyer that I am. I said, you are going to give me a consent form, aren't you? Um, so I signed them. And then the first time she was constantly going like this to me. Uh, but the second shot, she said, so I said, Mom, did they give you the shot? And she said, no, I know that they gave her the shot. But that's an example of, do I really know how she is? I know now less than what I did before. So as I always say when I'm, when I'm ending a, a talk with, with someone, I say, so what are the next steps? Waiting, waiting, okay, for personal contact with my mother because... My sister and I are all she has. That's it. And fortunately, I've been dropping in the conversation about uh, a neighbor that we had um, back in New York before I moved her up or down. And she said, oh, no. And so I got them to talk. Now, mind you, I coordinated with this very good friend. And I said, just let me know when you talk to her. So I figured I'd follow up with my mother. And she said, no, no one called here. No. So that's, you know, as much as I try to keep people in her mind, uh, it's hard to say. And now with the pandemic, it worsens everything. And the flyer that I had sent to Cheryl uh, yesterday is to keep in mind, now I'm, I'm, I'm constantly talking to people about brain health as I will to whoever asked me. And now when I saw that, I said, you know what, here's another uh, opportunity to, to promote, try to advocate for, try to convince people of how much we have to do. Link and I spoke recently and about staying active. I know I don't have to talk to Link and talk to him about staying engaged, going out for exercises, eating right, Lori. Uh, and so, you know, these are things that really make a difference, really make a difference. And yes, on the sad, sad reality is that we all, well, most of us would know that if you're over 65 and us women are screwed to begin with, are three times as like, uh, twice as likely, no, three quarters as likely to have Alzheimer's. So with those odds, I think that we uh, really need to think about keeping this healthy and keeping this healthy. And the pandemic was a kick in the butt. And what I heard last week was that doctors are thinking that this was just the first of many pandemic. So I think it's incumbent on us to learn from it and to think that we were not prepared for this and how we can prepare for the next one. Sorry to end on such a, a sad note, but, but with all the little bits and pieces of wisdom. I mean, I, I think Cheryl, I, I, you know, I've given you all that you need. <laughs> you absolutely have. That's a very, very important and personal testimonial of what you have dealt with, with your mom and are continuing to. And I think that um, um, we appreciate what you're saying. I think it's it's one of those things where you don't really know until you actually have to deal with it, and every situation is different. Um, 
I want to throw it open to questions. One thing I was just going to add, you had mentioned about um, a program, and I just wanted to mention to the rest of the people on here that on January 5th, I had done a program called Living with Dementia During the Pandemic with Karen Love, who's Executive Director of Dementia Action Alliance. And she was joined by a, um, a guest whose name was Chuck McClatchy, who is on the the DAA board and living with dementia. And he was in the early stages of dementia and very eloquently responded to the changes that have occurred. He has been living with it maybe about three or four years and he can't drive. And he talked about what he could do and what he couldn't do. And so it was really um, um, very helpful for, to me and I think to all listeners to find out that people who are in early dementia are in a different state than people who are in later stages. And so, um, and it sounds like for you, Martha, your mom is in the later stages because you said she's been living with it for what, eight years now, did you say? Yeah, for eight years. And the funny thing, I'm glad you, you touched on that because I learned a great deal from the two of them. And, and Karen was kind enough to invite me to a dementia conference a few years. And she wanted me to, um, present on the Latino experience. And, and I learned a great deal in, from that conference. And when I heard your program and listening to him, it was a lot of what I had heard, uh, but mainly that every person, each person with Alzheimer's, or if you don't know what kind of dementia you have, uh, is different like any other medical condition. We can be two people with diabetes and your diabetes is different from my diabetes and Alzheimer's is no different. And so what they emphasize at that conference that I went to, uh, she said, if you know someone with dementia, you know one person with dementia. Same with Alzheimer's, same with vascular dementia. Uh, it's just one and we can't group everybody together. And I learned a great deal, Cheryl, so I'm, I'm glad that you brought it up again. Uh, because that experience uh, and why I keep advocating and talking up about brain health, because when it's early onset, sometimes it goes really quick. Uh, the decline goes very, very fast. And sometimes it's slow and you're very aware. And But as he expels that day, that how much he sees uh, and how much he can uh, do at, in, in his stage. And my mother, you know, someone in the support group said to me that it was like seven or eight stages. And I said, what difference does it make? What difference? I, I don't really care to know. Oh, that's now, but wait till you get to the fourth stage. I thought that was very unkind. Um, and you just go with it whenever it is, or wherever it is, um, because where she's at with you is different than where she could be or someone to know, God forbid, with Kate, you know, it's going to be different. You know, mm -hmm. there's no, and there's no set time. You know, uh, if she was at mild, she could quickly make it to third, you know. So there is no set time or limit to every stage. It's not a, a normal progression of, of, of aging or anything else that you say in stages. So, no, I would, I would really... Um, listen to that program if ever uh, you should find yourself wanting to know more. Okay. I see a couple hands raised. Let's start with uh, Cindy. You have uh, your hand raised. Right. Um, Martha, I, I wanted, I serve on the uh, commission's long-term care residences committee. So I was curious whether the facility that your mother's in um, reached out to you during the period where you could not visit um, to report on her condition, or did you have to proactively, you know, get that in, call the facility and get that information? Uh, regrettably, um, their lack of contact and, and direct attention has been the same, which has been a zero from beginning to end. And why I, I thought that committee that, that my Mona um, created was, was necessary because their lack of communication 
uh, has been awful. And the reason that they or I get information is because immediately when I pick up the phone, I ask, who is it? And I make sure that everybody is accountable and accountable to me, as ridiculous as that sounds. Okay. Thank you. OK, um, Kate, you had your hand up. Yeah, actually, that was in part what I was going to uh, ask about what Cindy said, because I am now joining this um, LTCR whatever, uh, committee and my um, I'm liaison with um, Terry Dale, as you know, Martha, I think. And um, so I was just curious. It was that was part of the question what Cindy asked. But I mean, have you heard anything about are they trying to figure out plans for um more visits whatever that might look like is there any indication they're working on that or, or like have they given you to, told you anything in that regard coming down the pike well like i said they they i knew about the elimination by the federal government cms the elimination of yeah. those restrictions mm -hmm. okay that yeah. i think that was the wednesday and then i said i kept looking at my emails because they they won't call. They got into the habit of sending emails. And unfortunately, they sent an email late that night when the former administration decided to cancel all visits. And I didn't find out about it until I got to the nursing home and they told me no visits. For that, they immediately sent you an email, OK, which I had not seen. I just went about my business and because I didn't know that I would get anything from them immediately. Um, now, you know, we come to restrictions eliminated. There was no immediate email. There was no calling. Mm -hmm. um, and so I waited Thursday and, and nothing happened. So when I had my scheduled visit, because it was Thursday in the afternoon that I set it up, you know, on the other side of the glass and I called and they said, no, no changes. They are working on it. We don't know what we're going to do. Um, and it wasn't until last week. OK, so restrictions eliminated by the feds on a Wednesday. They had no change on Thursday, no change on Friday. And I kept calling and I said, so what is it? Now I got to wait till Monday. Oh, no, we won't know anything until next week. When I called early Monday, they said, well, we may have something uh, uh, later this week. I said later this week, later this week, really? And so that's why uh, the group from committee, the activities, are the ones who have been coordinating visits. Uh, and so who did not tell me that they had the iPads early on? I learned that offsite and I learned that from other things that I've been reading, but not from the administration. Mm. Again, why the committee is necessary to make them more accountable. I don't put myself in that position because my first charge is my mother. Sure, sure, sure. And so whatever I can help you with, I'm glad to do it. It's just nice to hear different perspectives because, you know, and that that so that's helpful. And thank you for sharing your story. I um, I, I co-facilitate a support group for caregivers of, of individuals, you know, caring for someone who's living with dementia or Alzheimer's. And, you know, you're right. Every story is different, but a lot of the challenges resonate. I mean, I hear that from families that it was it's just extremely hard. So thank you for sharing. Thank you for doing that. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Martha. And and to echo what Kate's saying, I think that's really important. It's not only the people who are dealing with Alzheimer's or dementia of some sort, but the caregivers as well and the support that's needed. That's that's one of the reasons why the group that Karen Love is, a support, is uh, associated with Dementia Action Alliance really helps focus on the caregivers as well. So any any other um, comments or questions for Martha? Okay, well, thank you again, Martha. We really appreciate your testimonial and your sharing. And, and thank you also for sharing that, um, that flyer that we sent out to everybody. So in case they couldn't join, us today that they have that information. I assume that they can get in touch with you if they want additional um, feedback. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you for saying that. So if, yeah, if there's anything else, um, that Global Council, which um, I'm a member of in some 
aspect of it. And um, so any other information, I'd be glad to. So I, I sent that because it was one flyer, but the report basically and just just a little tidbit that the report that they did on the impact of COVID on the Alzheimer's population is now, you know, now into heavy research because they have ideas. And I've heard it in, in several um, different discussions that there's a there has been a rise or there was a rise in the 2020 deaths due to dementia. Can they make the connection? Uh, it's under research. <laughs> so that it appears that compared to the to the expected or the or the expected yeah the expected number of deaths due to due to dementia uh there was a rise and so they'll have to look at it if it was it a coincidence uh now with the pandemic was it due to the pandemic but there's so many things that could have contributed to that you know um what the condition of the person is you know are we do we have those comorbidities and so that's why the person with with dementia uh, alzheimer's could have been, could have been uh, already at a weaker point, and they were hit with COVID, and so the number of deaths last year increased. So anything, yeah. If if there is, you know, uh, other questions, glad to take it. We will put in, you in touch. Okay, right. Cheryl. Sure. Thanks again, Martha. So let's move on. Cynthia Schneider is the Cynthia. Are you the chair or the co-chair? of the uh, I'm the chair. Uh, if anybody wants to be the co-chair, that would be great, but <laughs> we don't have one right now. Okay. Well, I had written in my notes two months ago that you were going to give a report at this um, uh, PIO committee meeting, and we would like to kind of not only hear what your goals are, or kind of what's happened. Some of the committees, needless to say, are kind of on hold right now, but it would be helpful to give us all an update on what's happening with housing and um, and what's been accomplished and whatever else you wanna tell us. Okay, thank you. Um, well, the um, the committee has, has been active because the county has several initiatives um, that are current um, that we are involved in. And before I get into that, I, um, to give you some perspective of housing and how it impacts older adults in the county, um, let me throw out a few statistics. Um, the Fuller Institute of George Mason University recently um, did a study for the county um, looking at data from the 2016 to 2018 uh, period, and that was the American Community Survey data, which is census data from that period. Um, and they found that, um, and, and I from that study they did, I just pulled out the parts um, that impacted older adults. Um, between 2012 and 2018, the 65-year-old and over population in the county increased by 25%. And it's estimated that between 2015 and 2025, the 65-plus um, population is going to increase by almost 32%. So of all the, the age groups, um, the older adult population is, is, is greatly increasing. And this certainly impacts housing. Um, when you look at what older adults are currently paying for housing, and right now um, in that 65-year-old cohort, cohort, almost 75% of those who are, um, no, um, 75 percent of that cohort are what's um, considered to be housing burdened, and that means that they are paying more than 30 percent of their monthly income for housing. And of those, um, okay, oh, let me. I'm, this is, okay, I gotta go back. No, 
it's 75% of the renters who are 65 years old or older are housing burdened. And of the owners, 35% are paying more than 30% um, of their income for housing. Um, most of the renters live alone. 76% of the renters live alone. And 35% of the um, owners live alone. So from this, um, we can speculate that there is going to be an increased need um, for those older adults who don't have significant assets to fall back on. Um, there's going to be an increased need for affordable housing um, for this group, as well as for other groups in the county. But again, focusing just on older adults, um, there there is this tremendous need. So um, the housing committee, our um, age-friendly Arlington housing goals um, actually fit into what was found by this data review. And our first goal is to advance policies and programs that focus on affordability and accessibility. And in as to affordability, um, we are working on um, two projects. The, the first one is our response to the county's um, missing middle study. And this is a study that is looking at the supply of residential housing and um, whether it should be um, zoning laws should be changed to allow for this construction of um, multifamily type housing um, in areas zoned for single families. And the multi-family uh, type housing that Missing Middle addresses is the detached homes, the duplexes, the fourplexes. It's not, does not include the high rise apartments and condo buildings. Um, so they are, the county is currently studying this. Um, Carol Patch, who serves on the housing committee, who's on this committee, is following that issue. And um, at um, some point, once uh, the county completes their study, we the, we, the housing committee, will make our recommendations to the aging commission as to our response um, to that. The second study that the housing committee is following is the review of the county's affordable housing master plan. Um, this plan was done in 2015, and it's how the county is um, going to, it's a action plan on how they're going to respond to the need for affordable housing in the county. Um, because I'm sure, as all of you well know, the county is, in terms of housing, is just getting more and more expensive. Um, and... Um, so the what is going on with the affordable housing master plan is that um, there is a review being done. The county is currently um, soliciting some uh, community input um, in response to the plan. And again, this is an area where um, the commission will be um, addressing um, what we think is missing in the plan um, and um, what we think um, uh, should uh, the county be doing in response to the uh, tremendous need for affordable housing. Um, I should mention that the county did a review of the initial master plan um, recently. And in their review, they actually quoted um, our, our housing committee's goals um, and also cited 
to one of our goals, um, which is to increase the number of affordable um, assisted living units in the county. As some of you may know, only Culpeper Garden um, provides affordable assisted living, and that's for very low income um, residents. And there are uh, 70, and these they're limited to 77 units over at Culpeper Garden for assisted living. And the other facility in the county um, that offers affordable assisted living is Mary Marshall. Um, but that facility is only for um, older adults. It's age 50 and over, but with um, intellectual or mental disabilities. So it's for a limited population. Um, I think Martha can tell you um, how expensive assisted living is in Arlington. Um, and there are those are the alternatives. So we definitely need more assisted living. The county has been um, more affordable assisted living. The county has been, or this commission has been advocating on this issue. We got the county board to recognize it as an issue last year. Um, so hopefully the um, update to the affordable housing master plan will um, address um, the need for uh, affordable assisted living in the county. Um, and the final goal um, that the uh, committee is working on is the goal that uh, promotes tools to help um, residents of Arlington remain in their homes of their choice, um, living safely and independently as long as they wish. And one of the objectives under this goal is to increase the use of universal design um, in, um, in homes. And uni universal design are those features in a home that makes a home more um, accessible um, as you age. Um, for example, um, doorknobs um, that are handles as, as opposed to a round um, knob because if you have an arthritic hand, those round knobs get harder and harder to turn every day. Um, another feature would be um, in the bathroom, walk-in showers, um, a higher commode, um, maybe higher counters. So there's a number of features that can be added, uh, features of universal design that can be added uh, to a home to make it more accessible. Well, right now, the committee is working on a checklist um, of universal design features that we are hoping that the, um, count, the um, Planning Commission's Site Review Committee will use when they look at designs um, and approved designs for new um, multifamily construction in, in, um, in the county. So that would be when they're reviewing a plan for an uh, apartment building, a new condo, um, or new senior housing, especially. So we are working on this checklist. It's almost done. And then our next job after that is to advocate um, before the Planning Commission to get its site review committee to adopt um, this checklist. And again, they're just items to keep in mind. Some are very simple, some are inexpensive, but um, they're um, features that do make the, a home much more accessible. Um, so we have, um, an ambitious um, work plan um, and the fact that a lot of is going on right now in the county um, keeps us uh, busy. 
So if there are any questions. Any, any questions? questions? Any questions for Cindy? Or Cindy? Cindy, it's, Cindy, Wendy. it's Wendy. Um, um, you know, I know, I know the, uh, the folks, folks doing the missing middle, middle study, study now are really, really very, very targeted on, on outreach and promotion of the study, trying to get um, as much knowledge that the study's there, and then, you know, potentially getting people activated um, to consider what solutions are and how they support those solutions. So I guess whatever we can do to help them um, with that promotion is worthwhile. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, a lot, um, there, there is a lot going on on it. Um, actually, and I don't have the date in front of me, um, the, um, Affordable Housing Solutions Group, Michelle Winters Group, is doing a webinar. With it's a webinar on the 25th. Okay. And is that, that what is, you're thinking of? That's the one with AARP. Yeah. Um, yeah. And with Erica Wood, um, who's going to talk about Age Friendly Arlington and the work of the Housing Committee. And they will be talking about this, the missing middle. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a controversial topic um, because um, the potential changing zoning laws in um, areas that are currently zoned for single family, the immediate thing it impacts is density in a neighborhood. Um, so, um, and then there's the issue, you know. How is this act going to affect um, uh, older adults? Um, will it will it have any impact on older adults? Um, but you know the commission has not taken a position on this yet, and we're you know part of just learning, listening to what has been done. Mm -hmm. You know my other comment, and it's it's a it's more a personal comment than a professional one. Is I I guess I read the. Uh, County announcement about the redevelopment of the courthouse plaza area, you know, coming up. And they're talking about residential housing, this, that, and the other. And then they say, and we've got five affordable housing units. I mean, it's just a ridiculously small number from my perspective. And again, I'm offering that as a personal comment, not a not representing my organization necessarily. Yeah, that unfortunately, right. The number of affordable units in these new buildings, um, it, it is small. And um, just by way of information, um, a developer, um, if they seek more density in what they're building, they have a choice. They can either provide a certain number of affordable units in that building and there's there's a formula in the county ordinance on how, what that number will be or they can make a contribution to the housing investment trust fund most developers choose to make a contribution to the housing investment trust fund but it appears that the courthouse developer chose to make some affordable units available, but unfortunately it's like five, I right. yeah. Um, so, you know, one question is for the review of the affordable housing master plan is, should we be requiring more of developers? Um, we'll see. Well, I wanna thank you. Um, Lori, you had your hand up? Lori Young? You're muted, Lori. Oh, of course I am. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to jump on your comment, Cindy, about the universal design. Uh, a number of years ago, um, the Housing Committee uh, sponsored the development of a, um, a video that um, focused on universal design and how uh, either developers or homeowners can make the changes in their current setting 
um, that were not uh, ugly and institutional looking, but in fact uh, could blend in um, with single family homes without calling out, this is where the handicapped person lives, um, or this is where the old person lives. Uh, there are very, very few, what we found out is, there are very few houses in Arlington that you can enter um, without having to go up a step or more than one step, um, which makes it necessary to build ramps um, in order for people who are chair bound to get in. But there are many aspects of universal design. I recommend uh, the link was on the commission's website. Um, Michelle, I don't know if it's still there. Or maybe we can find out. Um, but that's my comment about universal design. Well, and, and thank you for mentioning that, Lori. And in fact, um, a couple of years ago, my I did uh, one of my TV shows for Aging Matters was about universal design, and I incorporated that video into the, the TV show. And I, I can't remember because I've interviewed so many people in my life, I can't remember the name of the man who I interviewed, but I think he was part of the company that um, a representative was interviewed um, for that video. So if somebody is interested in watching that whole TV um, episode, they can just go on the Aging Matters website, agingmattersonline.com, and look at the TV show um, page. And it, the whole thing is there. And it was really good because it really expanded on what Cindy's talking about. So, but thank you for bringing that up. So, any other questions of Cindy? If not, Thank you, Cindy. That was very helpful. I took some notes and in fact, maybe getting back in touch with you sometime to see if maybe we could have some kind of a, I could interview you or somebody else about what's going on in terms of housing in Arlington. But in the interest of time, I'd like to move on. Lori, as long as you're pictured here, um, could and you get muted? I'm sorry? And unmuted. And unmuted, which is even better. That makes it easier to hear your report when you aren't. Could you give us an update on what's happened as far as the Age-Friendly Arlington Task Force and what's coming up? Um, I wish I could give you a, a comprehensive answer to that. Unfortunately, I uh, was out of the country for the month of February, um, totally ignoring the recommendation that we not travel. Um, I. I uh, shielded and masked up and, and got on a plane and got out of here. Um, but the task force is meeting every other month and we'll be meeting in April. And I will then be able to give you a, a comprehensive update at our next meeting. I can tell you that um, each of the committees of the commission have matched their goals as, as Cindy pointed out to the goals and objectives of the Arlington Age Friendly Plan. So as you are at commission meetings, as people are giving updates, you're getting a sense of how we're moving forward towards our age-friendly plan. Um, that being the case, we have people, as Cindy also said, uh, Erica Wood, who's part of the task force, is going to be doing this presentation. And there are people that are meeting and making presentations whenever asked uh, related to our age-friendly plan. Um, this June, we will be making a one year, well, June, July, a one year uh, update or evaluation of how we're doing on our plan to AARP. That's kind of an annual process. Um, we were approved last summer. And so we're now in the second year of our plan. Um, and we have two more years afterwards to see how we do in meeting those goals and objectives. Okay. Well, we'll look forward to it, and I'm pleased that I'm part of the task force, and we'll look forward to giving an update on what's happening on the PIO committee. Great. I'll actually probably have some more information soon. So, Okay, any other questions for Lori? If not, thank you, Lori. Appreciate. And we look forward to your next report, which will be in May. And... Um, um, Having said that, let's start with a, or continue with a staff update. Michelle, 
we've got three different possibilities here in terms of issues you may have more that you want to tell us. So go ahead. Absolutely. Uh, thank you all. And I just put the link into the chat if individuals want to access the universal design resources that are located on Arlington County's website. You're more than welcome to use the link um, to be able to do that. And if you have any trouble on the back end, Cheryl, if you are going to send a follow up email, you're welcome to use that link that I just put in the chat. Um, so thank you for the opportunity. It's always it's a pleasure to be with each of you and the updates that you all provided um, have been remarkable and to Martha's points and updates she provided earlier. I was just amazed and always appreciate everyone's advocacy and the work that you all are doing to make Arlington County a much better place to be. Um, so thank you again. But as it relates to program and staff updates, I do uh, want to, before I dive into the COVID-19 updates, I do want to share, um, if you guys are not aware, that we have uh, colleagues that are here today. Well, Carlos is not here, but Wendy Zinker is here. I'm not sure if you all are familiar with the CV committee uh, or not, but Carlos Velasquez and Wendy Zinker are members and serve as ambassadors to share COVID-19 updates and vaccination information um, across the community and across different networks. Um, and so I just wanted to, to plug that, that as well. If you all know of individuals who are 65 years of age and older, and who have not already received their vaccine, please let me know. Um, I am working very closely with Rachel and Mimona and many others in Arlington County Department of Human Services to help get people um, not only registered, but also signed up to get vaccines. From what I'm hearing from the community, the vaccination sites at Sequoia and Lubber Run and Walter Reed have been and going phenomenal. And so I'm so happy to hear that. I know last week I called an individual using the Arlington County's language line and the customer that I talked to spoke um, Herrick and he was just so grateful. At the end of the call, he was praying and he said, basically, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to get vaccinated. Um, as you know, Sometimes the issue is not related to vac vaccination hesitancy. It's related to access and it's related to some individuals not being able to either navigate technology or have the technology to be able to sign up. So I called this individual who was Ethiopian and spoke Amharic, used the interpreter. He said he had no knowledge of how to, to get registered. He didn't have a computer. He didn't have you know, a smartphone, he was still using his house phone, but that, that call was a connection uh, that he was grateful for. And so we continue to make calls from the county. And um, I continue along with many others to register people in the website. So there's a state website and it's called Vaccinate Virginia. Um, people can also call the one 829 48 4682, I believe, and I'll put the resources in the chat as well, um, unless Wendy has those handy. And um, I also want to uh, share with you all, if you have not seen the news that's come out through the county, um, there are many, many, many resources that have come down the pike in many organizations that are now offering the opportunity for people to get vaccinated. So there are about 300 federal retail pharmacy partners um, that are offering vaccines to individuals in Virginia who are between the ages of 16 to 64 with a high risk medical condition and also frontline essential workers. People can check the vaccine finder to find a pharmacy near them. I know when I looked on I think I looked on Thursday or Friday, uh, just out of curiosity, all of the sites at that time who were providing Johnson & Johnson 
uh, the one dose vaccine were all sold out. Again, that was at the end of last week. I'm sure that shifts and changes, but there are sites at um, Safeway, CVS, Giant. I mean, the list goes on. Preston's Pharmacy, I believe. So I'm so happy to see that there is more than one hub, if you will, of organizations who are offering this resource to the community because, it, you know, at, at one point, especially in the very beginning, it was bottlenecked. And it was, you know, it's still an issue of supply and demand, but now there are many more suppliers that are working together to meet the demand. And so with that, I'd like to shift and segue to to talk about the invitation. So last month I offered an invitation to Mamuna Ba Ducking Field and Dr. Bryna Helfer, who's the Assistant County Manager of Arlington County, along with Wenda Pierce, who's the co-chair of Arlington County's Complete Vaccination Committee. We worked with Brenda Cox at, over at Lomax to spearhead a presentation. And um, we talked about, well, I talked about the Medicare Advantage open enrollment period, which ends in about a week or so at the end of this month, but also we in preventative services. If you, you know, Medicare Part B covers the COVID-19 vaccine and also testing. But then my Muna, Dr. Helfer and also Wanda spent a significant amount of time in front of Lomax church members virtually, of course, talking about COVID-19, the complete vaccination committee, and we're only what Arlington County is doing to help spearhead these efforts and initiatives. There was such a high level of engagement. I was so pleased to see that people were raising hands. People were asking a series of questions. And it seemed to help alleviate any concern that people had. Um, and as you know, I think mostly all, if, if not, I'd like to share that Arlington County is offering resources for people to get transportation to the vaccines. And our partner here, Wendy at ANV, has been a phenomenal resource along with Red Top Cab. I believe Blue Top Cab is offering that uh, resource as well so that people we can re help to remove those burdens for people to get the access that they need to get to the vaccine clinic, which is critical. And um, thank you all for joining us at the Community Engagement Forum. I was uh, sitting in a, a virtual breakout session with Link Cummings, who's here with me today, and we had a wonderful time at the Community Engagement Forum. We had close to up, up to 100 attendees. There was a presentation from Lauren Dunning, who is the director over at the Milken Institute Center for the Future of Aging, and she works to develop strategic partnerships and initiatives that advance aging, uh, so very appropriate. And um, during the breakout sessions, I know that we talked about uh, the future of aging. Cheryl Spear had a, a, a breakout session herself, so if there's any information that you want to share or link any information you'd like to share as a facilitator uh, with the group that would be more than welcome. And of course, Carlos Velasquez, um, who's not here today, was also a facilitator in the group that I was with, with uh, Link. And then um, I do want to wrap up by just adding that for those who have not yet seen it, as it relates to outreach and programming, Next month, April 27th, VICAP is going to spearhead a Medicare coverage COVID-19 and preventative services presentation. That is going to be hosted by the Virginia Association of Area Agencies on Aging. And people can sign up and register through the VGCOA website. I'll share the link for that. And then Tuesday, May 11th, we are going presentation around the ABCs of Medicare. Um, talk about Medicare basics and Medicare 101. And I'd like to open it up to the floor in case anyone has questions. I'll just comment, uh, Michelle, that you gave a wonderful summary of our breakout session. Outstanding. Oh, thank you so much, Link. Thank you. 
I would also add, and thank you for all of that helpful information, Michelle. And um, uh, I'm also looking forward to, I think there is going to be a summary coming out, isn't there, of the community engagement forum, the findings, and that that yes. kind of provides a composite for the information from all three breakout sessions. Is is that true? Yes. 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 I appreciate that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So they're in the process of um, collecting the survey responses and also compiling the feedback from the breakout sessions. And once that process is completed, there will be an update provided at either the April or the May. Uh, the May more information will come down the pike about that um, to solidify the date. But please stay tuned. OK, so any other questions for Michelle? All right. Thank you, Michelle. That was wow. A lot of good stuff coming up and uh, and thank you especially for that update on COVID-19. There's still lots of people who need to be vaccinated. And uh, so that's very helpful. I think this is a good reason why it's I'm glad we're recording this session. We may want to share with those people who weren't here today so that they can hear everything that everybody's been saying. It's, this has been fabulous. So um, I'll just now open it up. Anybody who has some additional, any comments or updates or information that um, we should all know about? There's a lot of information that's been shared here in the other committees that needs to be shared with the rest of the world. We're grateful, Cheryl, for your being here and helping foster that communication. So, Lake, as long as we're, I'm seeing you here on the screen, did you have any highlights from your recent uh, committee that you wanted to share? Or when is your next committee meeting? Or we had we had a work session uh, with about 12 people, and it was an incredibly productive session. Uh, a number of people are signed on to help go the next step. We have a lot to do, but it's exciting because our role is reaching everybody and how to age better and what we can do or what we can motivate others to do to help all of our seniors. Yes, and thank you for your good work on that committee. With, with Andrea. Um, Kate, anything that you want to share with us about what's going on at Arlington Virginia Hospital Center? Yeah, sure. We've got we've got a um, great program coming up that we're doing in partnership actually with Arlington County AAA and the 55 plus program and pro aging. Um, it's going to be on April 20th. It's kind of our version of um, you know, we used to have the in-person senior resources and sharing information. This is obviously going to be a virtual event, but um, Steve Gurney is going to be uh, facilitating it along with, with us and with our partners. Um, it's going to be an excellent opportunity for folks really in the community, ideally, to come on and hear about the services and programs that are available throughout the community, whether they are individuals that are trying to, you know, age within their home or considering housing options or resources that might help them. Um, so we're trying to get the word out about that. It's April 20th, um, 12 p.m. until 1.30 p.m. Of course, you can jump in whenever you want. It'll be recorded, but um, I think it'll be a nice program and, and kind of our way of trying to get some information out during these times. And if you have something that that same group that I've sent everything out today, you know, or about, you know, in the PIO committee, let me let me know and I can just forward it to everybody. That's great. I do have a, a one page PDF I can send to you, Cheryl. Okay. And I would say that to you also, Michelle, in terms of those dates too, it's sometimes people just don't see it and that. So um, I'm always happy to share it with everybody as well. So thank you, Kate. Wendy, do you have anything to share about ANV? Um, th Cheryl, thanks. No, nothing more than what people have already talked about today. Okay. I'll so, just share that uh, you mentioned Steve Gurney, uh, pro-aging. Uh, he has 
typically during the week, a noontime program, each one different, each one bringing in a spokesman or experts in different fields associated with aging. It's an incredibly well-run set of, of discussions. You all ought to have your lunch hour uh, in front of your TV and, and watch that or com computer. Yeah. Well, actually, you're absolutely right. In fact, before COVID, I used to go to those luncheons all the time. Oh, yes. Yes. They, they were fun. But yes. This is okay. infinitely more effective uh, because he typically has a couple of speakers that talks about a specific topic and they delve into it uh, more okay. even than when we're uh, in person. Absolutely. No, that's very good. In fact, I'm going to note, and then I can probably also send that, um, how to get in touch with that. So um, this committee with how good. to get in touch with Steve. So I will write that down. I will also just add, since I'm the uh, POI, PIO committee member, that um, tomorrow, if uh, especially for the women on this uh on this uh, meeting call, the topic on aging matters is going to be about menopause. So I had uh, my guest is uh, Dr. Andrea Singer, who is in charge of women's health <clears throat> and part of the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Medicine over at MedStar um, Georgetown MedStar Hospital, and did a fabulous job. And then, of course, since we do have Jim Morris on the call here. I just interviewed him today and that call, that uh, program will be on a week from tomorrow. And everything you wanted to know about uh, preparing your federal income tax form this year. So, and Jim did a fabulous job as well. We have to pre-record all of the programs nowadays. So, so it seems like we are at the end of our um, meeting here. I always encourage, if you know somebody who should be on the attending these meetings, please send me their email address. And um, I'm always happy to add um, their name and hopefully they will tune in uh, or participate. So anything else that anybody has, any other announcements? Now that it's spring, hallelujah. Good weather's coming. <laughs> yes, indeed. And of course, the next meeting. Oh, this is Michelle. Yes, Michelle. I'm sorry. There's a delay no, on no, my no. end. I I'm sorry. I missed your hand. Oh, Go okay. Ahead. I do want to just share and remind individuals that our offices are primarily still providing assistance from a distance. We're still following the, the guidance from our account manager Mark Schwartz um, and there are limited program staff are uh, conducting face-to-face -face visits or in-person visits those are primarily our partners at the adult services and adult protective services programs they are conducting face-to-face -face visits as needed with of course the safety precautions nursing case management and the developmental disability services recently started to resume face-to-face -face assessments as needed. But I do want to share that most other programs, my program, VICAP, um, Senior Adult Mental Health, the ADRC, are, are still providing assistance from a distance, I would say 98, at least 98% of the time, 100% of the time. Uh, most appointments are being conducted by phone or Zoom because we're using telehealth. Um, so I just wanted to also put put that on the table as well. I know that people are starting to get vaccinated, but less than 50% uh, of the Arlington seniors have been uh, vaccinated. So we have, we, we've done a lot of great work, but we have a lot more work to do, including you know, individuals who are younger than 65 that are not disabled. So um, there's still a lot of vaccination that will go forth. And again, if you know anyone in that age group, 65 and older, um, et cetera, who have not been vaccinated, please do ping me, 
send me an email. You all have my contact information and let me know and I'll be more than happy to make a connection uh, with those individuals. Those that's a, that's all I wanted to share. Lastly, thank you, Cheryl. Well, and Michelle, I was going to ask you, and I don't want to take up the, everybody's time, but if there is any possibility that we can take the recording of this meeting and share it with um, those people who did not attend uh, today, um, maybe we can. You can send me a note and let me know how we can do that. I'd be happy to. Yeah. Yes. One one last yes. comment: the yes. Jefferson for the first time in about a year. We've opened our dining room today for the first time that residents are able to eat in person with all the rest of us. Hallelujah. <laughs> Congratulations. That's, that's great news. And I don't know if I don't know if you mentioned that's you great at the what? There was a comment. What did you say? I I don't I didn't say anything. Okay. All right. Well, congratulations, Link. I hope you and your fellow residents enjoy going back to the dining room. So that's that's good news. I'm having my table occupied by a 105-year-old person and one person who has not been out of his unit in over a year. Wow. So, it, it, wow. you know, getting back into reality. <laughs> Sounds good. God bless. Thank you, Link. Next PIO meeting date and time is on Monday, May 24th at 2 p.m. And we'll look forward to seeing you seeing you at that meeting. And I'm sure we'll see you at different places and times and, and meetings uh, before then. So I hope you have a good afternoon, all of you. Thanks for coming and go enjoy this wonderful weather. So have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.